everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome Lama David Christensen. Uh, David completed his formal training in a four-year retreat in France in the 1980s and some of the most influential Tibetan teachers of the century and has spent over 30 years studying and practicing Tibetan Buddhism across many countries. He is director of the Odiana Buddhist Center in Hawthorne and the Odiana Retreat Center in Foster. David is also a healer and renowned internationally as a Tibetan language translator. So welcome. And I'd like to start this with a simple um, breathing exercise for everybody, just uh, so we can also just a, just a simple exercise just to help uh, clear our minds. It's also kind of right, almost like a natural reflex that we do when we're feeling stressed. Sometimes we just take a sigh, just to sort of let go of whatever is worrying us. This is kind of like a, a big sigh. So we're going to take three nice deep breaths, breathing in through the nose. And as you breathe out, <coughs> breathe out through the mouth with a nice sound of ha, H-A, coming from the belly. I said that the sound of ha is also very strengthening for the heart and also helps to just release any blocked energy sort of that's particularly stuck around your heart center. So that's kind of a good exercise to do whenever you feel a bit stressed or <coughs> Things are impacting on you. You can just kind of let it take a nice deep breath and let it all go. So it's also used as an uh, exercise before we meditate, just to help us settle and clear our energies. So we'll take a nice, take a nice deep breath, breathing in through the nose. Nice letting go sound. Ah. And once again. Ah. And the third time. Ah. Ah. 
uh, Shambhala, which is on the teachings um, of one of my uh, main teachers called Nosho Kempo. Anybody who's maybe come across the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying is also one of the main teachers of uh, Sogorumche. And um, also, uh, as I think everybody obviously knows, the Dalai Lama um, brings to mind um, some years ago, like 1986, and uh, the Dalai Lama had. Uh, for a number of years I wanted to meet Nushal Kempo as he was a renowned um, master, particularly in the Dzogchen tradition, teachings of the Great Perfection. And um, at that time I happened to be uh, accompanying Nushal Kempo in, in, uh, in Paris and uh, so there was a meeting arranged uh, to meet with the Dalai Lama. And uh, so on, the Dalai Lama was staying in a big um, Hotel in central Paris. And on the um, early one morning, there was a taxi was sent and uh, took us to the hotel. And uh, <coughs> we were sitting downstairs in the foyer, and there was actually, I had a girlfriend at the time, and she was meant to be there, but um, she, she couldn't decide what to wear. <laughs> and so she was having, having trouble. So I think what to wear, and uh, Kempo had said to her, don't worry, it's, it's, it's just around the corner, and there's a chance that it may not happen, we may not even get to meet the Dalai Lama, so if, if it's going to happen, then I'll let you know, you know, uh, we'll call you. And so I was sitting downstairs, and then Kempo says to me, um, actually you could go and call Karina and tell her, I don't, I don't think it's going to happen, I don't think we're going to end up meeting the Dalai Lama, because it's, there's so many people here, and there's sort of a, was having a meeting with the Tibetans community in Europe, and so it was uh, not looking very likely. So anyway, I went off to make the phone call, um, made the phone call, came back, came home and disappeared. I'm sort of looking around, suddenly I hear this kind of <coughs> way up, <coughs> way up above from several. There was a big, like, huge, like stairwell in the center of this hotel. Kempo was screaming, waving his hand, um, come up, come up, and, you know, several floors up. And um, so I remember uh, um, rushing up the stairs and uh, got to uh, met Kempo and next thing we're standing outside the Dalai Lama's room. The Dalai Lama comes to the door and there was another Lama there who was uh, quite it's a very well-known lover in the West, and uh, he had, had actually arranged the uh, meeting, and uh, so standing there, sort of in, I suppose, or being Dalai Lama, um, the Dalai Lama was uh, introduced to Kempo, um, he's briefly introduced to me, and then the, the other Lama starts pushing me out the door, kind of like, this is secret Tibetan stuff, you know, so this is for, kind of like for Tibetans only. And I always say I was saved by the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama extends his arm, and as I was being pushed away by the Dalai Lama, the Dalai Lama pulled me, yanked me back inside. And uh, so I got to sit then on, uh, on uh, Kempo's um, audience on the lines of, with the Dalai Lama. And uh, so that was um, probably a conversation. They, they talked for maybe half an hour. Fortunately, being able to understand Tibetan, I was able to. Maybe that's also why they, why I was pushed out. <laughs> and uh, so, anyway, so Kempo, Kempo got to meet the Dalai Lama. Kempo used to suffer from. He had uh, had a lot of illness um, some years before in India. He had been. Uh, it's believed he had been poisoned. Uh, and there's very various sort of reasons why people get poisoned in India, but. Uh, and so from that, at that point, at that time he nearly died, but he, he had a very strong um, Eastern Tibetan constitution. He was kind of built like a rock. And because of his strong constitution, he survived. But he used to suffer from um, severe headaches. And also he used to generally talk, kind of talk in a whisper. And because he always said when he talked loudly, it made the headaches, made the headaches worse. And um, so, 
Um, so after the audience with the Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama asked him a lot of questions. He was asking questions about various sort of uh, different teachers in the Tsongkhya tradition. And I'm um, also asking him some philosophical questions and also just um, so after half an hour of kind of being questioned by the Dalai Lama, um, we, we, the Dalai Lama finished, uh, had, to, had to go off to his next appointment. And uh, so we got outside the room and then Kempo was, Kempo, Kempo was very unconventional um, and uh, quite, yeah, quite um, not, not the average sort of uh, Tibetan person. Uh, and, uh, so then we got outside the room and he said, Oh dear, so many questions. My head, my head is throbbing. Because um, the Dalai Lama said, "Oh, we must, we must meet again. Just come back, and I have more questions for you." And uh, and Kemba was saying, "No more questions. No more questions. Um, it's enough. And um, please, please take me to back to the countryside." And uh, so anybody else would have been like, you know, I suppose another opportunity to meet the Dalai Lama. They would have been sort of jumping at it. But for question for Kemba, it was like. Uh, I'm sorry, but I cannot take any more questions. And, um, so that's, that's a little introduction to um, who Kempo might be. Who we, um, he passed away himself in about 19, I think it's about 90, 98, 99. And um, so he was uh, um, very, yeah, very unusual. unusual. He wrote a, he wrote a, this actually, this poem was actually written in our, he was also one of the uh, retreat teachers in our, um, in a, I participated in a, it's a traditional three years, three months, three days retreat in France, and, uh, which is the traditional training for uh, lamas or, or teachers in the, in the school of the Nyingma or the Kagyu tradition of, or schools of Tibetan Buddhism. And uh, he was, uh, also, um, one of the resident teachers, he lived a lot of the time in our retreat. And uh, so during the, um, the first year of our retreat, he, w there was like a, um, a notice board. Well, actually, there was a whiteboard. And uh, so he, um, one day, we came into the kitchen and there was his Tibetan, Tibetan uh, Kempo had very, um, pretty wild Tibetan writing. Even some Tibetan had trouble reading his, his handwriting. And uh, so in his unruly script, he had, he had written this, um, this poem on the whiteboard, which, which, which meant that um, usually when he wrote something to Ben, that meant there was something to be translated. And uh, so it turned out to be this um, poem here, which is really, uh, you might say, um, a lighthearted approach to, to mindfulness or Mindfulness in Tibetan, the word for mindfulness in Tibetan is the word drempa. And drempa literally means to remember. There's a Tibetan saying which is remember to remember. Sometimes we, we know things but we, we forget. You know, sometimes the simplest truths are the ones that we most easily forget. Back in the Dzogchen teachings, uh, in Dzogchen Tantras, there's uh, a, t a teaching which uh, which says, for for the student who is ready, then all the master needs needs to do it is to point to the sky, and in through that introduction, all the Dharma can be understood. But then it goes on to say, for those beings who are more intellectually complex, then from that simplicity, the Dharma becomes more elaborate and more intellectual. There's a story of, um, there's the account of, there was a great Indian master called Naropa, who was one of the forefathers in the lineage of the Kagyu school. And he had been a great uh, pandit, a great sort of scholar, a 
was actually the head of this great Buddhist university in North India called, which is not very far from uh, Bodh Gaya, which is where the Buddha was enlightened, if anybody's had the opportunity to visit those places. Not very far from Bodh Gaya. Robert had been the head of this um, university and uh, was an incredibly renowned scholar. But even though he had such great intellectual knowledge, he still, in a sense, he still was not awakened, he was still not liberated, he was still, he was still caught in his intellectual knowledge. And it wasn't until he met his teacher, Naropa Nas of Tilopa, who was actually just a, like a wandering kind of yogi, kind of sadhu type, just wandered around, had, had no monastery, had no particular home. Until he, until he met his teacher, then um, he was caught up, you know, caught up in the, I suppose, in his intellectual knowledge and the, and the pride that comes with, you know, with uh, thinking that you know it all. And through that meeting with his teacher, he was able to be, in a sense, introduced through the teacher's skillful means. He was introduced to the directly to his innate wisdom, just through directly, which helped him, in a sense, shatter the concepts that he had regarding his intellectual knowledge. So in, from the point of view of the Zogchen teachings, there's simply two kinds of mindfulness. There's mindfulness that requires effort, and there's mindfulness which is the very natural, innate quality of our minds. It's called, it's called sometimes the innate, it's called Chanigi Drempa, which is the awareness of, which is the, which is really the nature of our minds, the true nature of our minds. So through, through, through meditation or mindfulness with effort, then we can be, could we create the environment for us to experience meditation or the mindfulness that requires no effort. And we can say that simply with meditation, there's meditation that requires effort, where we have the subject our minds concentrating on an object, whether it's our breath, whether it's a mantra, whether it's a visualization, there's the subject and there's the object. And so the practice is to keep to keep our minds focused on that object, to be to be mindful. But that, that requires that requires effort, requires some discipline, some training. Also, mindfulness is not requires more than mindfulness because if it's said mindfulness means to remember, so it means to remember what you what you're concentrating on. So if you're concentrating on your breath, then to remember that's what you that's what you're concentrating on. When the mind when the mind loses its concentration, when the mind is distracted, as it as it normally is, distracted by other thoughts, distracted by things that are going around us, sounds, things happening outside, then our mind gets distracted, wanders. So then we need what's called intervention, which means almost like an attentiveness or vigilance, which brings us back to the object of meditation. And then once again, we, we apply our, our mindfulness on that object. So mindfulness with, with effort is really just uh, a training, really a foundation for us to ultimately experience the, the mindfulness, the awareness which is our true nature, which requires no effort. So when we are aware, we are aware. That is, that is the quality of our, our, our Buddha nature, that is the quality of our, of our true essence. So this, uh, this poem written by uh, Nishal Kempo is called The Mirror of, of Mindfulness. And as I mentioned, I thought to just go through this and just, uh, there's a um, number of teachings which is uh, being published in Kempo's
some way it's sort of another bit of a, um, you might say, a bit of a closet Buddhist teacher. <coughs> we have little groups in Hawthorne, and uh, so we sustain our little closet in, in Hawthorne. So, um, so anyway, coming out of the closet. starts off in the traditional uh, Tibetan Buddhist way of offering a homage. A homage. So a homage here is not to any particular Buddha, not to any particular Bodhisattva, not to any particular teacher, but it is homage to the sovereign of our innate natural mindfulness, our own innate natural awareness. In the Zongjin teaching it says we have there is our we can we have our physical teachers, but the purpose of the outer physical teacher is to act as a mirror so that we can discover and experience our own inner wisdom teacher. And ultimately it is our own inner wisdom teacher that, that we rely upon. Which is our own yeah referred to as our own innate natural mindfulness, natural awareness. And these days uh, mindfulness is very it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, a bit of a buzzword, you know, mindfulness is mindfulness is sort of, you know, it's out there and uh, and that's a good that's a good thing. Some a few years ago there was a conference of the Dalai Lama in America and uh, there were some traditional Buddhist, Western Buddhist with Western Buddhist teachers and some few traditional Buddhist teachers felt that maybe it wasn't appropriate that Buddhist Buddhist techniques were being taken from the you know from out of the traditional context and then offered to the general public and uh, so that that question you know, was put to the Dalai Lama. And in his mimical style, in his you know, um, open mindedness, he said, "Well, the Buddha's teaching is to benefit and to help others. You know, so if it helps and benefit others, then it doesn't matter. You know, that's that's the, the purpose of Buddha's teaching is is to help others. It's not it's not some tradition that needs to be preserved, you know, to in its antiquity." It's, but it's, it's here as an active you know, force, hopefully a living force, a dynamic force, a way to, to liberate beings from, from their suffering. And there is, there is incredible suffering all around us. You know, it's, I mean, it's just... Um, and so we all, we, everyone needs all the help they can get in this, in this day and age. Traditional Buddhist teachings is called the Kali Yuga, the age of the five degenerations, degeneration in the quality and of the external elements that make up this world, degener degeneration in the sort of thoughts and emotional states of beings living in this world, and degeneration in the proliferation of weapons. Generation in new, uh, which is expressed through uh, new diseases, all kinds of things. This is reflected in in these times. I said in this day and age to to do something positive, or as Buddhist teaching is called, it, something to create merit is the energy is far more powerful in this day and age because at the time of the Buddha it was much easier to do positive things. But in this day and age there's such, you know, it's almost like going against the flow. There's such a, um, so to be, do positive actions, to be, for example, like a, a monk or a nun, maintaining the, the vows and so forth, it's seen as 
um, even more meritorious in this day and age because of the, sort of the power of the times. You know. So there is, as a reflection, I said that the external world is really a reflection of the group karma of the beings living in this planet. What's happening in the external world is really an expression, reflection of the group energy of all the beings living in this planet. All the natural disasters, all the all those kind of things that are seen as a reflection of the um, overall group, I suppose, state of mind of all the beings living in this planet. So there is incredible suffering around us. You know, we, we just have to you know, look at the headlines every day. You know, sort of people, you know, people being murdered, killed, car accidents, you know, just disasters. Um, not to mention, you know, just all the the boat people, all the refugees, all the camps, you know, all the people caught in, in the Barbar states in those limbo's between. Escape, escaping, you know, from one, one, one hellhole, trying, you know, trying to get to a promised land like Australia, and they end up in, you know, they end up in Venice Island. Um, there's all kinds of, you know, this incredible suffering, and so it really requires all our love and compassion and wisdom to, to keep ourselves healthy and sane in this day and age. So mindfulness is not just enough to be mindful, it also needs to have a heart. It needs to have a heart of compassion. We can be we can be mindful, but that could be just quite sort of sterile. But as in fact in the writings of Carlos Castaneda, you know, whether these are some doubts whether these are actually you know, fantasy teachings or real but there was a, where his teacher Don Wayne said, when you follow a spiritual path, follow a path that has a heart. And obviously in the heart, it's the heart of compassion. So mindfulness as a, as a core of compassion. In the Mahayana teachings, the, in the way of the Bodhisattva, it says, emptiness, the great wisdom, the Prajnaparamita, the great mother of perfection. Emptiness is not just empty, but it has a core energy of innate, unconditional love and compassion. That is, that is the, the true energy of our awakened, our life essence. Sometimes people ask, if, when they're meditating, how, how can they tell if their meditation is really working, you know, if it, is, it, if it, is, it, is it going in the right direction? And very simply, if through your meditation practice, if you're becoming more open-hearted, more compassionate, more considerate, more forgiving, then that's that's a good indication that your meditation is on the right track. If you're becoming more selfish, more exclusive, then obviously, from at least from the Buddhist point of view, it's, it's not it's not it's off track. You've lost you've lost the path. So in Kempo's poem, he pays homage to our innate essence, which is our natural mindfulness, our natural awareness. He goes on to say, I am the mirror of mindfulness. With careful attention, I reflect everything clearly. Look, Vajra friends, Vajra friends, here means refers to uh, uh, spiritual friends in the Vajrayana or tradition. Look about your friends, my spiritual friends. When you behold me, be mindful. Look undistractedly at the very essence of your own mind. When you're looking into the mirror of mindfulness, in that clear mirror of mindfulness, look without distraction at the very essence of your own mind. Mindfulness is the, is the very root of your spiritual life. It's the very root of your Dharma practice. In all 
not in all traditions it's not tradition that whatever tradition you follow that says be unmindful be be unaware mindfulness is the root of one's spiritual life mindfulness is the body of your practice mindfulness means it's the, <coughs> the support for your practice your meditation practice mindfulness is the stronghold of your mind mindfulness is what sort of gives you that, that's, that strength Mindfulness is the support, so here we're talking about relative mindfulness, mindfulness which requires effort, such as if we're, for example, doing mindfulness of breath. In the Satipatthana Sutra, which is one of the original teachings given by the Buddha, called the Four Foundations of Mindfulness, then there is mindfulness of body, mindfulness of feelings, mindfulness of um, dharmas and mindfulness of um, Chakidama and Nakidama and mindfulness of, sorry, of, of sensations or sorry, perceptions. So in, in so a mindfulness of breathing comes in the category of mindfulness of, of, of body. So relative mindfulness, to develop mindfulness, to develop, which is the basis for calm abiding meditation. Through calm abiding meditation we can allow the mind to slow down, to allow the mind to be clear, and so from that clarity then we can start to have what's called vipassana, or insight into the nature of our minds. So mindfulness, relative mindfulness is the first step to allow us to have the possibility to see, see truly into our own nature. You might say mindfulness, relative mindfulness is what polishes the mirror of our minds. Otherwise, if our mind is very clouded, and confused by all our thoughts, overthinking, confusions, negative emotions, <coughs> if there's no clarity, clarity in the mirror of our mindfulness, the mirror of our minds, then there's no possibility to really see into our very essence. There's no possibility for insight. So relative mindfulness is, is the support for us to experience what's called in the social teachings our innate awareness wisdom. So through training in relative mindfulness, then it opens up the door, the portal to experience our own innate awareness, wisdom. Mindfulness is the support of Mahamudra and the, especially in the traditions of the Sakya and Kagyu and Gelug schools, Mahamudra is the, the teaching and practice on the nature of mind. So it's a support for those teachings and practices. And also in the, it's called the, the Nyingma school, the, the ancient school, the original school of Tibetan Buddhism, uh, is support for the practice known as Mahati or Sokchen, the Great Perfection. You may have come across some books, um, some popular books by, for example, uh, Lama Saridas and or you may have read the Tibetan book on Living and Dying, which is either based on the Nyingma <coughs> Sokchen teachings. And also it is the support for the practice of understanding of the great middle way philosophy, the Majjhanika. So without my, mindfulness, it says, if you are mindless, if you have, if, if you have, if your mindlessness, if you have no mindfulness, this will allow all the negative forces to overpower you. Actually, in, in Tibet, um, for some for some yogi kind of meditators, meditation was almost.
almost like an extreme sport. There were some meditators who took their practice very seriously. It's quite, it's quite um, to the point of life or death. For example, if you're meditating on the edge of a cliff, you don't want to lose your mindfulness. You're sitting on the edge of a cliff. Need to know where you are. <laughs> you can't. You can't afford to drift. Drift off. Oh, there are other examples. Sometimes the meditators, we yogis, would meditate <coughs> with a with a um, burning bladder lamp um, um, balanced on their head, which obviously um, would tend to make you sit very straight and very still. So meditation was quite, you know, was quite a serious thing and quite a very important thing. And so I think it's important when we do we do meditate. Sometimes it's a little bit like we sort of make a lot of effort to to meditate. And I presume. Please uh, try and meditate, or you have an interest in meditating, or we, and it's like we've, you know, we have all this. We go to a meditation class, and you know, and a lot of the effort actually goes in getting and sitting down on the cushion. And so by the t by the time we've gone through the effort of getting there, sometimes the actual time that we meditate is not as productive as it could be. Sometimes our meditation ends up as being opportunity for us to have a big thinking session. Or, our, or as our minds normally do, all kinds of things, you know, suddenly start popping up and we suddenly get you know, more solutions for all kinds of things. You know. Or we're suddenly working out our schedule for the next year, <coughs> for the next year or next week or whatever. So it's really, I think, given Especially in this in this day and age where our time is so precious. Back in like back in the good old days in Tibet, before the before the Chinese came, people had a lot of um, had a lot of time and time to there wasn't there wasn't T V, there wasn't radio, not until at least actually the you ever seen um, Seven Years in Tibet, the movie about the life of the Dalai Lama. You might remember that he had this old radio that was broken and um, I think he, through meeting Hadri Kara, or he, and he used to delight in sort of, you know, playing with the, with his um, radio and, sort of, you know, and fixing it, but he went, you know, it was a, you know, radio was, that was a pretty special piece of equipment in Tibet, you know, Early days of the when the Dalai Lama was in Tibet, so there wasn't much. You know, there was nothing much to do in Tibet really, apart from you could be a trader, you could be um, a herdsman, you could, a nomad, or you might come from a wealthy family and um, have servants. And generally, people went unless you had the wealth to have tutors. The only people went, the only real education for the average person was through the monastic system. And 
So unless you were wealthy, then you could afford tutors, but so generally not that many everybody could read and write, read and write. And so um, generally there was a lot, lot more time to and I think if I think if television had gone to Tibet at the same time as the Dharma, we might have had some serious competition. <laughs> so, in so, so, so many ways, spiritual practice, you know, Dharma practice was actually gave people something to really engage in, to really you know, put their energies into. And um, the written language was, was developed because the Dharma was being translated from Sanskrit into, into Tibetan. So the Tibetan language was um, devised you know, so, to translate Sanskrit, so there was the written language that was and um, so, so a lot of, lot of things focused around the, the Dharma or the Buddhist teachings. So generally people had a lot more time and, and freedom to meditate. And also there was a culture if, that if you want to meditate, then if you, wanted to be, if you wanted to practice mindfulness in a really serious way, that if you went off to a, a cave or a, wherever, people would be happy to support you. If somebody heard there was a, some, there was a guy living up in the like well, came up in the, the hill nearby, and people would naturally go and, and make offerings. You know, they'd take stories of um, different yogis and meditators. People would just naturally would uh, respect what you were doing, and they would be happy to. They would also feel also feel it was meritorious to would be positive for them to uh, share in in supporting and uh, helping somebody who was trying to truly practice and to sense to gain understanding and wisdom and so forth. So it was a lot, lot easier to, to practice and a lot and time was not such an issue. In fact it was all the time in the world really. But um, fast forward to um, Melbourne 2014. Um, I think uh, for many of us, you know, life is very life is very hectic, life is very challenging to fit all those things in. So when you do get to finally meditate, then it's important that you really have, you really need to, it's not just enough to sit down and think, okay, now, now I'm kind of meditating. But now, okay, you've got here, you've got on the cushion, that's, that's just, that's just the launch, that's just your launching pad. So the next step is to be really mindful, is to really be disciplined, to be really focused when you do meditate. So if you're, whatever you're practicing, if you're focusing on your breath, or if you're reciting a mantra, or if you're visualizing something, then to be really diligent, to be really vigilant, to really focus on what you're doing. Otherwise, half an hour might pass, an hour might pass, and you've been sitting there in meditation, but really, your mind's just been wandering a lot of the time. And given that we don't have all the time in the world, then it's important that we use our time in the most you know, beneficial way, really use our time. So, so mindfulness is really to be to mindfulness, to remember what we're doing and when we're meditating, also when we get distracted, to be vigilant in bringing our mind back to the object of our concentration. Otherwise, if a meditation just becomes a sort of uh, an opportunity for our mind to run right, then it's sort of we're not really we're not really getting very far. We might be going backwards even. Remember, Kempo, Nishal Kempo used to say in Tibet, there were thousands of um, meditation yogis and practitioners and people who meditated. But still, there were only out of all those you know, thousands of meditators and practitioners, there were still only a handful that really who became accomplished, who really got somewhere. And the reason for that, as he said, was simply just how mindful they were. Everybody was given the same techniques, had opportunities to receive the same teachings, had wonderful teachers, but it all boiled down to your, the individuals, you know, the discipline in their 
in their practice of just on the end, in their mindfulness, in their vigilance, when they're as to whether they really evolved and progressed in, the, in their practice. So I think that's really you know the thing for us to remind ourselves when we do meditate. It's not just enough to sit down and think, okay, I'm, I'm meditating now. I can relax, you know, but in a sense, that's just the start. We really, really need to be very vigilant to really focus on what we're doing. <clears throat> As it says in Kempo's poem, with mindlessness, if you are not mindful, you can be swept away by laziness. Without mindfulness, then all kinds of faults and errors kind of creep into your practice and into your life. With, mind, with mindlessness, if you're not mindful, and if you lack attention, then whatever you do, you will end up accomplishing nothing. Mindlessness, as opposed to mindfulness, creates piles, can create piles of shit. Means mindful. If you're mind, if you're mindless, then you can create a big mess in your life. And we see this all the time. As the Buddha said in his teachings, that it was advisable for people to avoid drugs and, and alcohol. Not because drugs or alcohol are inherently bad in themselves, but it's when people use them as an escape or as lead and in escaping they become drunk, they lose awareness, and as we see all the time in the news, through alcohol-infused craziness, then people create you know, so much suffering you know, in their lives and the lives of others, and it goes on and on. So, so it's nothing wrong with the actual substance, but the way we use them, the way, the way so if we lose our mindfulness, then disaster happens. You know? So that's why the Buddha advised to be careful of you know, intoxicants and things that affect the state of our mind. You know? Ultimately, don't lose your awareness. You know? That's what it's practice is to be, is to develop awareness 24-7, even in your dreams. In the <coughs> Tibetan teachings, there is the practice of dream yoga. As we spend uh, a third of our life sleeping, if we live to be <coughs> 60, normally we sleep eight hours a day. That's you know, a third of the day we spend sleeping. So if you've lived to be 60, you spent 20 years sleeping. It's, <laughs> it's a, bit of a, scary, a bit of a scary thought, really. You spent 20 years of your life sleeping. So in the wisdom of the Tibetan teachings, um, it's important that we can also bring some awareness in, into into our into that time when we're sleeping. And the initial, I suppose, without going very deep into that, um, explaining that practice, but initially the, the first step is to, before you fall asleep, is to make the intention to recognize your dream as a dream. That's what you should fall asleep with, is to, is to in your mind, is create the intention, the awareness, the mindfulness, to remember that your dreams are just dreams. So uh, to develop lucid dreaming. So it's when you are dreaming, if you're having a, a nightmare, or if you're having you know, sort of a luscious dream that you don't really want to wake, wake up from, then you're aware that it's it is just a dream, lucid dreaming. So that's that's the first first step in dream yoga. So mindlessness, the lack of mindfulness in our lives creates you know, creates a huge mess. You know, we just see that everywhere. You know, it's, it's a huge you know, particularly um, as we know, alcohol is you know it's a, you know, it's a huge problem in our society because not. Something wrong with it itself, but 
that's because of the way human beings you know, use it, the way they use it, and obviously losing, becoming intoxicated, you lose your mindfulness, and disaster follows you. In the traditional stories in the Buddha's teaching about uh, there was a monk who, because um, monks, monks take vows to avoid intoxicants, and all the vows are designed to really basically give you support so you can develop concentration and awareness. That's the purpose of, of monastic vows, so you can focus on your samadhi. There was a story of one monk who was, who was basically had a there was a um, I don't <coughs> wish to be um, showing this dick here, but uh, I'm sure it probably happened to nuns as well. <laughs> And there was a story of a, of a monk who a woman that fell in love with him, and uh, she was very infatuated with this monk. And uh, basically, she said to the monk, "If you don't sleep with me, uh, I'm going to kill myself." And of course, that's one of the root vows of of a monk is is to uh, is is the vow of celibacy. So if you if you break that vow, that's you you finish. Finished your vows. It's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a root. You know, some vows are repairable. That's irreparable. That's one of the root downfalls. And so, um, anyway, so the monk was sort of um, obviously felt this woman was was quite quite serious. And uh, so anyway, she must have been very persistent. And so when when so he really believed that she was going to kill herself, so he sort of thought, well, and um, I think, I think there, was also, that's right, there was also like a, there was also a, a kind of a get out clause that if he, if he didn't sleep with her, that uh, then he should at least drink some alcohol with her or something, have a drink. And so, so in the end he thought, well, it's probably better, you know, better sleep with her and uh, that's, you know, that's better than drinking and uh, so, um, and, sorry, no, no, sorry, so he thought it's, it's probably, probably better to, to drink the alcohol than sleep with her, because um, then that sort of seemed like the, the least, uh, the best outcome for him. And so, was, anyway, the story goes that he, of course, he, he drank the alcohol, and as you know, if you don't, you know, if you don't drink very much, then some, you know, a little bit of alcohol can, you know, suddenly be very strong, so he drank the alcohol, got drunk, and um, ended up also got so drunk that he slept with her as well. <laughs> and so the moral of the story is, you know, that uh, to avoid to avoid um, alcohol, avoid being intoxicated. So as it says in Kepo's poem, if you lose your mindfulness, then it creates it creates a big mess, it creates a huge pile of literally shit in your life. So so be mindful. So without mindfulness, it's like you all it's like you're sleeping in sleeping in your own in an ocean or in a pool of your own, own urine. Which is a very um which is also a very powerful image. It seems to also quite often happen to people who get get very drunk. <laughs> Unfortunately, you see, you know, homeless people on the streets, or um, then that's usually quite often the case if they've been drinking as well. So, so mindfulness can lead, you know, creates, you know, a big mess. Urine is very, you know, unless you're doing urine therapy, then you don't really want to be lying in urine. That's one of the, this is a, this is a form, ancient form of Ayurvedic medicine, but it's also, urine is one of the, um, it's called uh, used. It's called one of the yogis' medicines. In there's some retreat manuals where, especially when yogis are living in the mountains by themselves, and they don't have a local uh, pharmacy or doctor, then um, urine can be used as as a self medication. And uh, so there are there are benefits and qualities to 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 urine. So we won't, we won't go into any Tibetan medicine here, but. Uh, uh, or yogi medicine. So generally, you don't want to be sleeping in your own urine. So it's it's pretty smelly and pretty uh, you know, messy. 
Without mindfulness, then you're really just like a, a lifeless corpse. If, if, you, if you don't have mindfulness, if you're not aware, then really you're just, you're just like living. You are like a, a lifeless corpse, like a zombie in a sense. So, he's, so Ken Boyle says to my beloved Dharma friends, please, please be mindful, you know, please be mindful. By the aspirations of my holy teachers, lamas, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and also all the lineage masters, may all my spiritual friends, may they attain a constant mindfulness, and through such mindfulness may we ascend to the throne of perfect enlightenment. So through the power of mindfulness, as, as I mentioned, there are so many practitioners in Tibet that practice Dharma, so many practitioners that have access to all kinds of wonderful teachings and spiritual technologies, but still there are only a handful who really realized those teachings, really became awakened and liberated. And as Kimbo said, it all boils down to the power of one's mindfulness and awareness and vigilance. So Kimbo uh, concludes in, uh, with a with a colophon, with, which, which is usually, which is just a, um, a way of being humble. Where he says. These words were spontaneously composed by the fallen monk, the foolish ox with buck teeth, Jamyong Dorji, who offered these words to his Vajra friends who possess the eyes of Dharma. May virtue, well-being and peace may all be auspicious. So this offered to his Vajra friends, his spiritual friends, who possess the eyes of Dharma. Dharma, then, as the writer said, everything can becomes a teaching. Everything, everybody becomes like your teacher if you have, have the eye of Dharma. I often joke it's not it's not the third eye is not like it, the in the case of Lobs and Rumpa. Have you ever read the books of Lobs and Rumpa? Um, was um, basically. Tradesman who had, had this amazing imagination, and he wrote all these books about Tibet. And so, in one of his books, he describes quite vividly how he had an operation to open up his third eye. So, our Dharma eye, our wisdom eye, is not uh, not something on that level. We need a physical operation, but it is also when we have the wisdom, when we have we have the eyes of Dharma, then everything becomes like a teaching, everyone becomes our teachers. And that way we can, we're always learning, we're always developing. We never lose the path of Dharma if we have such, such a view and such a vision. So summing up, in, in essence, there is mindfulness that requires effort, and there is mindfulness which is really the innate quality of our Buddha nature, the innate quality of our wisdom mind. But in, for, in, in order for us to experience, to rediscover, to reconnect with our innate mindfulness, as I mentioned, it's not just mindfulness is all very well, but it's there also should be a heart of compassion. It should be a core of love and compassion. That should be the energy of our mindfulness. Otherwise, mindfulness could be just quite sterile, quite, quite bland, if there's not that heart there. So a natural mindfulness, that mindfulness, has the spontaneous energy of compassion. And as I mentioned, if you want to check whether your meditation is going in the right direction. 
And if your heart, hearts are naturally opening, if you are more tolerant, more compassionate, more patient, then you can be assured that your meditation is working. If you're becoming more proud, more conceited, more cut off, more confused, wilder emotions, more self-grasping, then your meditation is, um, is going backwards. Thanks very much, David. Uh, Thank that's you. the last talk for the this weekend's festival.